I want to encourage you this morning um, that no matter where you find yourself today, there is no shadow that he won't light up. There is no mountain that he won't climb up. There is no wall that he won't kick down. There is no lie that he won't tear down to come after you. I want to encourage you this morning. Now, we can sing that song and we might just default it to say that it has all to do with our initial relationship, salvation, but it has all to do with every, with every person in here today and wherever you are. And I want to encourage you that uh, the, the powerful words that we just sang are as true today as they were when Jesus walked this final week to his death. Amen? Amen. Amen. I come to um, the fifth I am saying of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life in our sermon series on uh, Jesus' look at and description of himself. And uh, so if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. John chapter 14, um, verses 1 through 7. And so let me just um, tell you what I kind of feel that this sermon this morning, of all the sermons I preach, may sound the most narrow. It may sound like it excludes the most people. It may sound a lot like there is no grace in this sermon this morning. But it is full of grace. It is full of mercy. So don't walk out on me too early. Don't check out too early because it may, it may sound a little offensive. I'm just telling you, when, when you talk about this text, um, I think we have to talk about some things that make us feel uncomfortable in our culture and in our present position uh, of, of where we find ourselves right now. So hang with me. Hang till the very end. Um, I think you'll see the grace and mercy before we get to the very end. But I, I, I just, I'm warning you now. So if you need to leave, if you get that uncomfortable, I get that. And, you know, just come back next Sunday. It is Easter, and we're going to talk about the resurrection. So um, it's, it's, next Sunday's a lot more feel good than this Sunday is. So let me just tell you that. Is that really funny? Then, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so, so John chapter 14. Verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place, you know the way to the place where I am going. And then Thomas said to him, and what do we, for a lot of reasons, what do we call Thomas? What's his... What's kind of the adjectives that we use to describe Thomas? Doubting. doubting. Everybody say doubting. Yeah. Doubting. So Thomas, he said, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. You know, he's kind of doubting Jesus' statement that he just made. We don't know where you're going. Um, you know, no, Philip. So Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And I was, we're going to stop right there, and that's, that's what we're going to discuss today. That's what we're going to look at. Back in the 60s, today is, you know, is not only the beginning of Holy Week, but it's also the beginning in, in Walker County of spring break. Now, in the 60s, um, if I were to have gone somewhere um, during spring break, when I was growing up as a child in the 60s and early 70s, if I had, my family had decided to take a spring break vacation, which, by the way, they never did. I, I don't think in my entire life I ever went on a, a vacation during spring break, mainly because spring break... 
I, I think I may have talked about this before, mainly spring break fell during crappie season. Everybody know what crappie season is? Crappie is a fish, and there's a season where you fish specifically for crappie, and that happens in the spring. So spring break always fell during crappie season, and you could bet your last dollar that my daddy was not taking his family on a vacation that did not include fishing for crappie. That's just the way my family rolled, and it rolled the entire time that I grew up. But if we had taken a vacation in the 60s and early 70s, there is only one primary destination we would have headed to back then. It's at the beach, and it's called what? Panama City. Yeah, when I was growing up during spring break, everybody went to one location. They went to Panama City. Now, the biggest discussion about going to Panama City is which way you were going to go down there. And there was, a, there was always a, a, a debate, a huge debate, about how you were going to get to Panama City from then, from Tuscumbia, Alabama. Uh, we all agreed that you had to get to Birmingham, and then that you had to get to Montgomery. But it was when you got to Montgomery, you had a choice to make. Were you going to continue down the interstate? Were you going to go down Highway 331? Or were you going to go down Highway 231? And that was your choice. All three of those would get you to Panama City. And they would literally get you to Panama City within minutes of each other, and yet people in Tuscumbia, Alabama, I don't know if they did it anywhere else, but in Tuscumbia, we would argue for hours upon hours about which way is the best. Well, it's, there's less lights, you know, there's less traffic lights in towns if you go 331. Yeah, there may be, but that road is about as horrible as it gets, and you're going to drive 35 the whole way down there. Or no, you can go 231, and you get to see some bigger cities, and you have more places to eat, and so on and so forth. Or you can just stay on the interstate as far as you can and then cut through, and it's faster. No, the reality is, is that everybody that went, they, got all the, they all got to Panama City within the same amount of 15-minute window of time. That's the way it really worked out. And so they, we, would, we would argue. Now, um, over time... Uh, Panama City became uh, a destination that became less desirable for a lot of different reasons. And so the proliferation of Gulf Shores and Orange Beach and Destin and everything west of Panama City began to flourish. And now, now, Panama City is making a comeback. Why? Because they've developed the West Beach. If you've been down there recently, you can go to Panama City, you can stay out on the West Beach, and you don't even have to mess with this part over here that all of us went to as children. Now, we always went during the summer. We just didn't go during spring break. We'd go some during the summer. And you went, when I went, you stayed right there at St. Andrew's Bay, somewhere close, and you ate dinner at Captain Anderson's. Of course you did. Everybody did. We all took the exact same vacation. Every vacation to the beach looked exactly the same. So we had choices. There was lots of ways. Jesus said there's only one way to the Father. Now, we have tried to make the way to Jesus, to the Father. We've tried to make the way to the Father in heaven kind of like the choice that my generation had to get to Panama City. Except now, the generations now, we're trying to legitimatize about 10 or 12 different ways to the Father. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus said... I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And when I first started this sermon series, I tried to make the point, that I, and I pointed to this very message as its chief um, illustration of my point, that this is very singular. This is not, does not, when we use the words, I am the, that is a singular word. It is not plural in any shape, form, or fashion. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Look, folks, if we believe anything about the Bible, if you want to believe next week when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, you also are required to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and everything that our world is trying to tell us is a way to the Father is simply not true. It is simply not true. And so we need to understand what this is saying to us this morning because you're being bombarded. Every day of your life and every day of my life, we're being bombarded with preachers 
and teachers and agnostics and atheists and everything else under the sun that are trying to tell us that there are many ways to the Father. And there's only one way to the Father. And there's only one truth that allows us to live in that relationship. And there's only one life that we get because of that. I need you to look this morning eternally. That this message, this, this text, not only has present application, it has eternal application. It's a both-and message. So not only are we talking about how we live right now, we're talking about the, Jesus Christ saying, if you want to get... If you want to get to this place where I'm preparing for you, if you want to get to this place where I'm leaving and going and preparing, and if it were not so, I would have told you it wasn't so, but I've told you it was, and so it is, then here's the way to live. Here's the way to get there. Here's the truth, and here's the life. And so he first says, I am the way. And when Jesus says that I am the way, he is saying that I am, I am the way to the promise that the Messiah is fulfilling. He is saying that I am the way to where we are going. I am the way unto salvation. And there is no other way to be saved except through the love of Jesus Christ. And we can, we can throw out as many other plans as we want to. We can, we can think through some other system of understanding. But there's only one way to the Father in terms of being saved, and that's that we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. We confess, we repent, we invite Christ in. Whatever that means to you, whatever that image conjures up in your mind of inviting Christ into your life, that is the way to the Father. And it is through living for Christ Jesus that we get to the Father. That's the promise, the pathway of the fulfilling Messiah it is the way unto salvation. It is the way to where we are going. And we cannot compromise that point. We cannot compromise that point. Jesus Christ is the way. It's not our goodness. It's not our um, intellectual understanding. It's none of that. It is the very fact that we submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And we just sang it. We, we don't deserve it, and we can't earn it. It's all by the grace of God that our sins are forgiven and that we walk in His way. But that's the only, that's the only choice we have. And it's made possible by the grace and the mercy of God. And then he says, I am the truth. And watch what he does here. He, he makes a progression. He says, I am the way. That, I'm... This will get you started on the process. This will get you started toward the Father. This will get you in relationship with the Father. And then he says, I am the truth. And when he declares that he is the truth, he is saying, I am the guide to your behavior. He is saying, I am the morality definer. He is saying, I am the decision maker. He is saying, I am the way that helps you understand right from wrong. That's the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word is that this, God, this Word of God, it defines, it, it guides our behavior. It defines our morality. It helps us make decisions. It shows us what is right and what is wrong. And we live in the grace of God to understand fully how to live His truth out in our life. And we can't do that on our own. It is by the mercy and grace of God that we call on each and every day of our life. And we say, God, by your grace, can I live by your truth? Because outside of his presence in our life, we can't. We will live the most defeated person ever. We will live as the person most frustrated if we try to live out his truth. If we try to behave in a way that we think is right in our own in our own efforts, we will be frustrated. If we try to be the most moral person in the world, we cannot be. If we try to make good, solid decisions in our own, in our own manner, we will mess up. If we try to understand what is right and wrong, we cannot do that outside of the presence of God in us, who is by His grace leading us in every step that we take. But we've got to live by His truth. If we want to get to the Father... We begin with a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then we live 
in his truth and his truth alone. We have no choice about that. And then he says, I am the life. And we most, we might understand that the most of what he's saying when he says, I am the life. Because I believe most of us in here would say, look, outside of Jesus Christ and us, our life has very little value. We struggle to find our, an understanding of our own self-esteem. We, try, we struggle trying to find value in what we are doing until Christ came in our life. And we discovered that the life Jesus gives is as a value giver. He is our hope provider. He is our value giver. He is our hope provider. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to hear in, uh, recently in, in several different contexts um, lay people sharing testimony of how they've tried to find hope in so many different ways and they found nothing but frustration and came to the conclusion that their hope was found in Jesus Christ. That wasn't, that wasn't preachers I heard preaching on TV that I was listening to in a podcast. It was lay people just like you sitting in the pew who were given an opportunity to share what Christ meant to them in, in many different contexts all over the city. And they simply came to the conclusion that I'd lost all hope until I rediscovered Christ and the hope that I have in Him. He is our hope provider. He is our abundant supplier. He is our abundant supplier. We talked about in a sermon earlier, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And he's the one that supplies the abundance of life. And the abundance of life is understanding the fullness of God. And, 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 and we continue in that journey every day trying to understand the fullness of God, trying to understand fully what it means to live under the umbrella of the holiness of God and what the holiness of God means and how we keep marching toward that and, and, and the, the great separation between our flesh and our spirit and, and how we move toward God and His holiness and understand the fullness of God. Because that's a promise of Scripture. Look, if you want a promise to hold on to this morning, hold on to the promise that is that it's God's heart. It's God's desire. He wants you to know His fullness. His fullness. Everything about Him, He wants you to experience. In its depth and in its breadth and in its length and all of that, He wants you to, he wants you to live in that abundance. The life that he gives is the separator of heaven and hell. He's the source of power that we live by. You see, it's by his grace and by the life that he gives that our life is separated in, this, in terms of eternity, in terms of our eternal life. That's why I want you to think eternally. Because in the very end, we will all want to spend... I want you to leave this morning. I want you to be encouraged that, that you, want to, you want to live your eternal life with God. You don't want to live your eternal life separated from God. And it's we've got to live in His life. We've got to live in the life that He gives us so that we can live this life with Him, so that we can live eternity with Him as well. We don't want to miss out on that. We don't want to, we don't want to miss out on our eternal life with Him. And he is our power. He is the source of all that we're able to do. And that, that power is not available anywhere else. That power is not available um, if we know the right people at the power company. They can only provide so much power. But it's the power of God that supplies power for life. And we need that. We need that. Because, let me just assure you of one thing. Is that for everything Jesus desires for you, in terms of being the way and the truth and the life, Satan desires to steal it from you. And... Um, I, I put it this way uh, last Tuesday night in um, our disciple Bible study, and so it made it 
into the message this morning. God and Satan has equal desire to own your heart. Now, that may upset some of you. That may turn some of you sideways. But just believe me. Trust me on this one. God and Satan has an equal desire to own your heart. But here's the good news. There is unequal power to obtain it. There's equal desire. There's unequal power. God has greater power. In fact, it's not only unequally, it's a total mismatch. You know, uh, again, if you're into basketball, it's a 16 seed versus a 1 seed. Except really it's a 338 seed or however many college Division I basketball teams there are versus a number one seed. It's the team that didn't win a game versus the team that won every game. That's the differentiation between the power of God and the power of Satan to rule in your life. And you have to claim that power. You have to claim to live in the life and the power that God has given you so that you can overcome every attack of the devil that comes. That's the life that he's given you. That's the life that he wants you to experience. That's the life that he wants you to live. And that's the promise of God's word. I am the way and the truth and the life. The life includes this, him being the power source of our life. And some of you have experienced that power greater than you could ever think or imagine. As from the moment that you surrendered your life to him, you said, I, can, I can't ever imagine that, help, that ever happening. I was on a pathway of self-centeredness. I was on a pathway to lead my own life. I was on a pathway to do my own thing. And all of a sudden, God convicted me, and I yielded, and he saved me. And there was power in that salvation. And you've encountered circumstances and situations that are beyond your understanding that only happen by the power of God. You made it another day because of the power of God. He's the source of life that we have. You see, and we see that, we see the evidence of that every day. We may not recognize it, we may not acknowledge it, but we see the power. So I invite you, in his grace and in his mercy, don't lose your way. Understand the way of God. Don't lose sight of the truth. Don't lose sight of the truth. And live in the abundant life that he desires for you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we pray today that you will move in our hearts, that we will come centered on this statement that you made about yourself. And Lord, if we have lost our connection at either one of these points, you being in the way, you being the truth that guides us, you being the life that lives within us. Father, I pray that we take this moment to reconnect in whichever area that you convict us of this morning. So help us do that, Father. In Christ's name we pray.